Okay, um, we finished cutting our uh, leading edge plywood, and our saw blade that we need next uh, for doing some ripping and cross cutting is the one that we said we were going to clean. So it's been sitting with the uh, Easy Off oven cleaner, and um, I'll just show you how easy it is to remove the pitch. You can see it's on the paper towel that the wood has deposited on the blade. So now we're going to have a nice clean blade that won't burn our nice spruce or our plywood that we're going to cut. And so it's a simple way you can maintain your own blades. Um, and if you take good care of your blades, they'll last a long time. Just like your saws, don't leave them sitting out in the shop. You know, when you're not using them, put them away where they don't get uh, banged up or damaged. The, uh, the little trick of using the oven cleaner is a good one. So uh, during the break, I took out the zero curve uh, guide, you remember, and I put, I'm going to use the uh, metal one. Um, we're going to put our uh, heavy duty kind of 40 tooth uh, cross cut blade back in. The machine is unplugged. Always, always unplug your machine when you're changing blades or servicing at all. Another thing that you can do to make your saw run a little bit better, more true, is to buy these backup discs. And any good uh, tool company like uh, Grizzly will sell uh, the steel backup discs. And there's two of them. One goes on each side of your blade. And you put that on first before you put the washer. And then, of course, you put your uh, reverse thread nut back on. Nice. Now you're going to need a little block of wood or something to stop the blade from turning. Got to tighten the nut up and take the wrench and gently apply force. You don't need to over tighten this nut. You just want it good and tight, but not crazy tight. Okay, so now we're ready for doing our next demonstration. Okay, so we just demonstrated uh, cutting a thin veneer sheet. Now I'm going to demonstrate cutting some aircraft ply. Um, in the section on wood specifications, we talked to you about how many layers of uh, aircraft ply has to be, and you'll want to look for the official stamp on the plywood. Um, right now, we're going to get ready for one of the uh, other portions of the video on doing routing. And what we want to do is the, the Jenny wing has uh, a center rib. And uh, we have to make lots of these out of this uh, aircraft grade ply. That's one that we finished. Here's one of our patterns. And uh, it's just a piece of masonite that we've drawn our wing rib on. And here's our stock that we're going to use. So we're going to lay it out as economically as possible. We're using a carpenter's square. And I just want to make sure that I can get the whole rib with its curvature on this one sheet. And we're going to cut uh, several of them on the table saw all at once, you know, consecutively. So I've set the uh, carpenter square at a distance that I know will allow me to get the entire rib. And um, one of the other little hints I like to offer is um, have plenty of pencils in your workshop and get yourself a battery operated uh, pencil sharpener and always have a sharp pencil when you're doing this. That way you have a consistent line thickness that you're cutting to. Uh, it doesn't vary. So we've uh, set this carpenter's uh, square at the right length and we're going to draw a line. Oops, my mistake. And now we're going to cut several of these strips out using the fence and the infeed board. And 
this instance, we've got our wide uh, slot in our uh, table saw. We've got our infeed table that I described earlier that's going to give us uh, the necessary support of the plywood. And we're going to adjust the width of the cut to the correct width of the board. Once again, uh, you don't need the table saw much. You just want the carbide piercing through the veneer. You don't need four or five inches above the wood. You just want to clear the wood. And you want to have your push stick handy. Okay, so there we go. We've got our blanks cut in the aircraft ply uh, that we're going to use uh, when we make these uh, Jenny ribs later on in the show. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, abrasives and sandpapers. Um, you need a relatively small variety of sandpaper uh, if you're just doing woodwork. Um, but you can have a variety of, of different tools that are very handy. Uh, let's start with the sandpaper itself. Um, I just buy local uh, hardware store brand, but I try to get the very best quality. And um, I like to buy it in pretty big packs so that you get some e economy. And just so people have an idea, I generally start like around a 180 or 150. That's about the coarsest I want to use on spruce. Um, if you're working in ash, you can go a little bit coarser. Um, but you, the coarser sandpaper tends to leave uh, a harsh uh, scratch on the spruce. Um, 220 is a good general uh, sandpaper use throughout, and then 320 if you're doing some very fine work on, on the edges of um, like thin veneer plywood. Now let's turn to um, some of the tools that I use. Um, my favorite in the whole shop is the little mouse sander. Um, they have a Velcro back sandpaper, so you can change this when it gets worn out real easily. You can buy these in bulk uh, online, uh, much cheaper than buying them at the hardware store. That's what I do. And at the end of the video, there'll be a list of suppliers that you can check out. Um, you can, um, of course, change the grade of sandpaper, starting with coarse and going up to super fine very quickly. Um, not so much for woodwork, but a lot for doing a metalwork, but we still use it in the shop as an air-driven belt sander. And it's real handy. Uh, you have to have a compressor with sufficient uh, air supply. Um, but uh, it does get into tight places and, and, and it's very helpful for doing uh, uh, sanding and removing a lot of material quickly. An alternative, if you don't have access to a compressor, but it's a little bit bigger, a little more difficult, is an electric uh, belt sander and you'll see that the belt is considerably wider so you're kind of limited to how much you can move in and out but the nice thing about this particular uh, Makita brand is it does have a variable speed so you can slow it down and you really control how much uh, material you're removing now kind of the monster in the shop is your big belt sander and this would really be used infrequently on uh, spruce if you had in the case like you needed to to knock down uh, a wingtip bow or blend something quickly and you needed to move a lot of material or there was a lot of glue that needed to be removed. I might use this unit, but it's very aggressive. Even though you can put finer sandpaper, 
uh, we tend not to use it very often. Okay, one of the other real useful uh, sanding machines that you're going to want to use in your shop is a big 12-inch uh, disc sander. And um, I don't carry a lot of variety of sandpaper. I have a real fine, um, like 220, and then I use either a 100 or a 120. And um, they're adhesive back uh, uh, discs, and I like to buy them in large gross to save on cost, and I get them online. And we'll share the supplier with you at the end of the video. Um, just a few cautions and ideas about the machine. Um, when you first get the uh, machine, you want to make sure that everything is squared up correctly, and you want to make uh, it more useful, uh, efficient for you. Um, when the, when the uh, sander comes to you, the manufacturer provides you with these uh, screws that you need to remove every time you change the sandpaper or adjust the, the uh, table here. And the first thing I did was um, get rid of the machine screws, and I bought um, some wing nuts, okay? And um, this is just a simple wing nut available at your hardware store. But what this allows is for me to quickly uh, put, take the, the table off and put it back on. Um, there's four of these screws and um, I can do much faster and I don't need a wrench. Um, so you're able to uh, change the paper or adjust the angle of the uh, table much more quickly. Another thing you want to consider is um, just because the table is uh, you know, screwed down pr correctly, you always want to check to make sure it's perpendicular to your sanding surface. So either with a, a machinist square or your carpenter square, once you get your new sandpaper on there, you know, make sure that the surfaces are perpendicular to one another. Um, that way when you go to sand something, you have a nice square edge and finish. If you want to create a beveled edge, you can. You can adjust this to whatever angle, but when you're done, of course, you want to return it to a square. Um, the only other note that I'll uh, suggest is um, when you change the sandpaper in a kind of dusty environment, a woodworking shop, it's possible for uh, dust to get on, on the uh, platen here. And I like to clean it with a solvent uh, prior to putting a new disc on. And um, you want to make sure that uh, the platen is perfectly clean. You take the backing off of your disc and you put it on there. Of course, this wouldn't be in place. And um, the reason is, if, if this disc is uh, dusty and, and you have any kind of um, debris in there, um, you won't get a good adhesion with your uh, abrasive pad. And you, uh, it's possible that it could actually come off uh, after some use. So I recommend that you, um, before ever turning the machine on every time, you know, I always just test it, make, give it a good firm pad against there, um, and make sure that I clean it with a solvent before putting on a new sheet.